record it and then pause it. Recording. Good afternoon, everybody. I imagine many of us are in the midst of finals or coming up on finals. So we appreciate you spending some time with us. And welcome to the Navigating Privacy Policies in Online Education. My name is Brandon Gaynor, and I'm the Acting Director of Professional Development at CBC at One. And I'm pleased to introduce you to our wonderful facilitator, and actually one of our very own, Valerie Senior. So to give you a bit of background on Valerie, she served as an instructional technologist for many years at Saddleback College, and is currently doing a consulting role with us at CBC at One, handling many of our LMS functions and sysadmin functions. Anyway, during this webinar, at about the 30-minute mark, I'll be dropping a link in chat to our survey, and then once more towards the end. Please fill out the survey to let us know how we did and so that we can create programming that is more tailored to the needs of the system and just users moving forward. Finally, while CBC at One offers badges for completion of our facilitated courses, we don't offer a badge for attending this webinar. However, if your institution requires proof of attendance for flex credit or other professional advancement, please again remain to the end of the webinar. Complete a copy of the survey and request a copy of results. For many of the schools, that seems to have served as a flex credit, but if for some reason that isn't sufficient, please contact, contact us at support at cbc.edu. I'll drop that email into the chat soon, and we will find some other way to get a proof of your attendance. Lastly, this question comes up quite frequently, but I just want to reassure you all that this webinar is being recorded and a copy will be available within a few days on our webinar site, which I'll also be posting in our chat soon. So give us generally about a week to see that and our associated slides up at the same place that you registered for the webinar. Without further ado, I will hand it over to Valerie. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us, and welcome to Navigating Privacy Policies in Online Education. This is kind of a practical overview of it, um, so I wanted to start you off with a quick little funny. Jimmy, please write the answer to that question on the Blackboard. Jimmy, before I answer that question, I need to know how you're going to use that data, and that's really what this is all about today. Students throughout the state are expressing concerns about how their data is being used in online classes. So today we're going to focus on third party applications and websites that are used in your courses or that you use for your online courses. We're going to talk about the laws that are related to the use of those third party apps or websites. And I'm going to show you some examples of which applications we're actually talking about. We're going to also talk about the difference between the institutionally implemented applications or third party apps and the ones that you might put into your own class. And then we're going to lastly talk about the simple steps that you can take to ensure that students know and understand their rights to the privacy and policies that are outlined in your course. So before we get started, I wanted you to put in the chat what you think of when you're when you think of privacy in an online course. What comes to mind? Go ahead and throw it in the chat. Shout it out. FERPA. Yeah, FERPA is definitely one. Anybody else? Anybody? Everybody thinks of FERPA. Personal information should be accessible between students. Personal information between students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Anybody else? So you're right, personal information between students and, and usually you outline those uh, privacy policies and in, in, in your communication policies during your orientations. Um, so it that is definitely an important part of things. Um, today, we're really going to talk more about the privacy policies that are related to uh, external businesses. So I know you guys have all heard of FERPA. You know, everybody pretty much knows now uh, about what FERPA does. Um, just a brief overview, it gives parents and guardians the rights to access underage student records. So if they're under 18, 
Um, it also protects students that are over 18 from giving parents or guardians access without consent. And there's a whole bunch of other things that FERPA in, enables or disables. Uh, but those are not the ones that we're really going to talk about today. We're going to talk a little bit more about the privacy of uh, what businesses are doing with student data. And so we're going to focus on the California Consumer Privacy Act. And that's a really hard one to say sometimes, so I might mess it up. Uh, so what is it that they're doing? How they're sharing information? And you might be asking yourself, well, Valerie, what does this have to do with my online class? And really, it's, it boils down to we use online third-party tools every day in every one of our online tools, from Canvas to Zoom to Flip to Canvas credentials. All of those are third-party businesses. They all are things that we're using that is not within the institution. And so we need to let the students know how that information, if any, is being collected, how it's being collected. And why that's important is because this Consumer Privacy Act is saying that it is. Now, it was enabled between the, um, in the 2018, okay? Um, and I'm gonna just bring this site up because it's also a site that I'd like you to bookmark. It's a really helpful site. Um, it has a lot of really good information, but the Consumer Privacy Act really just bare bones. It's the right to know, the right to delete, the right to opt out, and the right to non-discrimination for exercising those rights. And then in 2020, it was updated and it went into effect in January of 23. Things are a little slow the right to co correct any inaccurate personal information and the right to limit the use. So these are really important things to know and it really pertains to how you're using those third party tools, businesses in your online classes. CPERA in the chat, I'll be happy to go. And we will also be allowing, we've got all of these apps along with a whole bunch more um, that will be at the end of the presentation. I have a whole list of URLs for you guys. Um, the reason I think this is a great site to bookmark is also because, and hopefully today will not only help you with your online classes and student privacy, but it will also help you in your personal life, um, keeping your own information private. And so over on the right-hand side, you'll also notice that there's a whole bunch of information about uh, data privacy, um, data breaches, identity theft. It's just a really helpful site that you may find very interesting and, and informative. Are there any questions about the law that we're talking about at the moment? Anybody? Okay. So uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, this is Angela Jones. I have a question okay. about, so it says it's the California so-and-so law. So this only applies to California? It does. And, it, and it, in fact, you're segueing perfectly into my next statement, which was that I was really surprised to see that only 15 states currently have comprehensive data privacy laws in place. Um, and California is one of them. If you're curious about which other states they are, I can name them off for you. Does anybody want to know? Yes, I would be curious. Okay. So we've got California, Virginia, Colorado, Utah, Iowa, Indiana, Tennessee, Oregon, Montana, Texas, Delaware, Florida, New Jersey, and New Hampshire. And there are federal laws in place for privacy, data privacy, but they are just kind of a general thing. Um, most of the privacy laws, uh, the legislation is actually enacted at the state levels. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. There are more and more states that are becoming um, more 
uh, comprehensive about their data privacy laws, but it is it is still only 15. And I was I was actually kind of surprised by that number as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close out that CCPA. And um, now I kind of want to talk to you a little bit about some terminology before we get in depth on what we are actually talking about in your classes. Because you've already heard me say apps and third party tools. And I'm going to use a whole bunch of other mumbo jumbo that you may want to know. And again, if I'm going too fast or if there's something that you need to understand better, please feel free to either put it in the chat or, or pipe up and say, hey, I need you to go over that again. Um, so some of the terms that we use when we're talking about this is LMS. So LMS, you guys familiar with that? Sometimes it's called a CMS. That's an old term maybe. Um, LMS is your learning management system. And in the state of California, of course, it's Canvas. That's our learning management system. LTIs. How many of you have heard of LTIs? Give me a give me a little heads, hands, something. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. So most people have heard about LTIs, but what are they? Their learning tool interoperability is actually what that acronym means, and it really doesn't tell you a heck of a lot more, does it? It's a fancy way of saying that it is a plugin to Canvas. Um, and APIs are similar. They're not identical, and APIs actually uh, application programming interfaces. Without getting too crazy with the technical uh, mumbo jumbo there, they connect in their apps that you can put into things that are not just Canvas, other, other external tools. And then we'll talk about these other external tools called apps or third party applications. Most of those that you guys use a lot of times are websites. Uh, I'm going to just throw out Padlet or um, something to that effect that you might use in some of your classes. Uh, Quizlet's another one everybody likes. Um, embed code. I don't know if any of you are using this, but this is a, a good example of that would be YouTube. You take a YouTube video and some of you are using the that URL or the uniform resource, I'm sorry, the embed code, the HTML code, and you're putting it into your Canvas course so that it's embedded in the course. And then URL. This is just kind of a, just an FYI. URL is Uniform Resource Locator, and that's a website address. And we use website addresses instead of the number it's actually an IP address. Website addresses are an alias for that IP address, which is an internet protocol, and it's just a number. Yeah, otherwise, all websites would just have a number, and you would say, oh, go to 10.121.28.5, instead of something that uh, sounds a little catchier like Canvas. <laughs> By the way, that wasn't their, their IP address. Anyway, so the next thing, of course, is cookies. So before we start talking about cookies, I wanted to know what's your favorite? What's your favorite cookie? Do you have a favorite cookie? Mine is Snickerdoodle. Oatmeal raisin, that's good too. Chocolate chips. Yeah. Chocolate chips are my favorite if I wasn't allergic to chocolate. Macadamia nut, oh yum. All right, somebody else after my heart with the snickerdoodles. All right, so uh, now that I've got you guys uh, hungry and your attention, um, I don't have any cookies for you, but uh, the cookies that we're going to talk about aren't exactly as tasty. Although they do make your uh, browsing experience a little bit nicer. Um, cookies are small files that are stored on your computer that help you uh, help make your visit to a website more um, customized. And every site in the world uses cookies. Every site that you go to on the internet is using a cookie somewhere along the lines. Um, and there's really no way to get around not accepting cookies. Um, 
So if you go all the way back in the history of cookies, they were originally made for those of us who can remember this dial up. It made your experience on the web a lot faster because when you use dial up that one that sounds like the fax machine and you love that noise because it meant that you were connecting with the world and searching Google for everything. Um, it, it, it also had temporary little files that it would send to your computer to make that image come up faster or to uh, help you with your shopping. And that still is true today. That is what works. And there's several types of cookies. And so the temporary session cookie is what we're talking about with shopping. It expires after your session ends and it helps to customize your experience on the website. It maintains your login sometimes. It tracks where you're clicking. So, you know, that helps web developers determine how they're developing their website. Are you clicking on that uh, button that you had um, on the you know, lower right hand corner? Um, Persistent cookies, and I, I call these creepy cookies because these cookies remain on your computer and can be used to track your activity. And it they can grab your IP address. Remember I was talking about that computer number that, that's the URL? Well, they can grab that. Um, they can identify your computer and your location services and see where you've been um, or where you are. So, you know, those are a little creepy. Um, persistent cookies, they still, they, they still work for good. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to scare you away from, you know, accepting any cookie ever. Um, they still will make your experience better. It's just that it's good to know, uh, what these cookies are, and what they're doing. Persistent cookies, um, with web beacons, which also sign, sound kind of nice. Yes. Your question uh, is, does using a VPN protect us from persistent cookies? It can. It can definitely set, uh, help with that. And um, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about how those things can protect you. But yes, VPN is one of them for sure. I use that when I travel a lot. Um, so persistent cookies with web beacons, which sounds so nice are actually tiny little images that are placed on a web page or even in emails to track where you went on a particular area on a site. They're also known as web bugs. Um, they're usually a clear little GIF that's one pixel by one pixel by one pixel, and it's located someplace on the website. Again, the intent for this is usually, um, it's usually because a web developer wants to know a better way to design their pages, but they can be used for nefarious reasons. So it's good to know. Um, the last one, is, it's not really the last one, there's several other types of cookies, but the, the other one is the flash zombie cookie. So the reason I'm bringing this one up is because a lot of people say, well, you know, when I get done with my browsing, I just clear my cached files. How many of you are familiar with that? practice or you've set your browser cookies so that they don't stay or you do private browsing, those types of things, right? So how many of you, show me your hands, how, how many of you are using those kind of security safety things? Uh-huh. And so, so those are all good best practices, but zombie cookies are actually something that regenerate after they've been deleted. I could talk about, um, you know, use these. These are stored outside of your cookie location. So they're not in the browser usually. They're stored in some temporary, you know, hidden file somewhere. So um, those are all things that are important to note. Now, as Christina said, you know, you can use a VPN. And for those of you who are not familiar with VPNs, they're a virtual private network and um, you can get those. There's all kinds of uh, businesses out there for a fee. You can uh, set up a VPN and um, it's great if you're traveling and those kinds of things uh, to keep you safe. But there's also opting out of those third party cookies. And this is gonna bring us back to that consumer privacy law, the California consumer privacy law. 
a lot of times you're going to start seeing those types of third party opt outs. Um, and it's because of the, these laws that are now being implemented because people are starting to become more and more aware that there's these crazy zombies <laughs> floating around in your computer. Um, so it's important. Uh, also retargeting cookies, you know, they, they will, uh, sometimes you go to a site uh, and you go there and then they've purchased, they've actually sold to an adver advertising company and they would grab your email, for instance, and send it to you. All of a sudden you get all these emails from, you know, my favorite place, Wayfair. So um, the best thing to do, of course, is to not accept them. But I'm going to show you an example of what I'm talking about because you're saying, okay, Val, this is great, but what are you talking about? I'm talking about sites like this, and this is a Canvas site. Down in the lower left-hand corner, are you guys seeing the pop-up that just came up? Okay, fabulous. And it says, I accept and cookie settings, and then there's a little X up in the upper right-hand corner. How many of you are actually reading that information? Let me, let me see some hands here. I see some laughter. So all of you are doing an opt out or, or going to cookie settings and taking a look at what the website is doing with your data. Have you all done that? So on this site, and it's different on different sites. Uh, every one of them has a different policy and or maybe their cookie settings. So I usually will go here and click on the cookie settings and I will look at what they're doing. And you can see that Instructure has a pretty good policy where they go through the cookie policy and their privacy policy. And if you click on this plus sign here, it'll give you more information about what it is that you are saying you want. Now this site has it set up so that it's on by default. Some sites have it set so that it's off by default and you opt into it. Not many of them are doing that, um, by the way. <laughs> uh, but you know, some do, some don't. So it's really good to know when you're going to a site to decide on which which sorts of cookies that you want. Do you just want strict, strictly necessary cookies? Or do you want necessary and functional cookies so that you're always able to go in? And if you turn these off, you know, what happens is you may or may not have a different experience, a less uh, engaging experience, but um, you can always come back and and turn them back on if you want to. Right. So I'm going to confirm my choices and then I'm just going to close this out. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about those types of cookies. So how does this relate to you guys now that you know about those creepy cookies and some of the ways that those data uh, mining places can gather information? Um, we can talk about how to analyze implement and inform your students about the third party tools that you're using in your courses so that they have the opportunity to make those informed decisions and understand their how their data is being used if it's being used or if they can choose how it's being used any questions so far is anybody creeped out by the creepy cookies yeah me too all right, so Canvas is our learning management system. We all know that, right? Um, Christina, does this mean if there are any LTIs? Um, so yeah, and that we're gonna get into that a little bit more in depth about the LTIs, but definitely um, it has a, an impact sometimes on how you're going to implement different things. So Canvas provides those privacy policies. We already saw a little bit about what they do. Um, and since it's our learning management system and it's used throughout the state, that would be an institutionally implemented privacy policy, right? The, it's, it's there. And um, in fact, if I click on this instructor pri privacy policy, I will then see 
and I'm going to just click accept. Haha. -ha. Um, I will then see all of the policies that are related to Canvas and or their affiliates and how those privacy policies are applied. So this is a great site to keep handy. Um, although, and I'm put the, I'll put that in the chat for you. Although they also have it on their homepage. So they have uh, all kinds of um, policies down here. So you have a privacy policy, you have cookie notices, and you have an acceptable use policy. So, you know, Canvas does have it on their login. This is good information for you to know so that when students come to you and they ask you questions about how Canvas is using their data, you can refer them to some of these places and, you know, let them know this is this is what is out there. Um, is it required for you to put it in your syllabus or orientation or, you know, any of that kind of thing? No, because it's already posted in other places, but certainly if you feel like you want to, um, it's, it's it can't hurt. Um, so, uh, now we we're talking about canvas, like an umbrella of canvas, right? It's the main, I'm just going to say it's the file cabinet. And then inside the file cabinet, we have other files that go in there. And those are those LTIs or APIs, those, those applications that are implemented that are other third party tools, right? So. We have things like Canvas credentials, used to be called Badger, and now Canvas owns it. Uh, it's, um, you know, PlayPosit. It's another uh, application that is utilized and, and implemented through your institution. So this is where it gets a little crazy because every institution has different LTI policies. Some institutions, uh, they vet those um, LTIs or applications, external tools. They vet them um, through an online education committee or some such entity. And then they install them based on that criteria. And we're gonna actually go over some of the criteria in a little bit. But other institutions, um, and, and some institutions allow for faculty to um, install LTIs themselves, like because they want them to try it out and see how it works. Um, and other institutions, a lot of uh, universities, for instance, lock down their, their uh, LTIs so you can't install them without a approval from a committee or campus administrator. Um, so it's important to kind of understand that LTI is just because you're talking about it, LTI that's in Canvas doesn't necessarily mean that it's, that it's not something that is a third party tool that you've installed. Does that make sense? Okay. So along those lines, we're going to talk about institutional policies that are posted by the college or university or your district, if you're in a district, um, they, they vary widely. And sometimes this can be tricky when you're looking for privacy policies that are institutionally implemented because you'll search out those policies. And a lot of times the policies that are found on the websites for the institution are actually geared more towards how that website itself is using um, data rather than your online policies for, for um, using those in online classes. And there's, it's, it's a little hard sometimes to understand the differentiation. Um, so it's important that if you are in question about, you know, trying to find any privacy policies relating to online classes at your institution or district, that if you can't find them by doing a search, then contact your department chair or your dean and ask questions. Find out if they have anything so that you can put those in the course if you decide that you want to. I have some examples of some really good uh, privacy statements. Uh, Cornell, Cornell University has got this really good one. And you can see that it's, it's not about the website uh, for Cornell. It's about how they're using Canvas and 
any online tools that are in Canvas, right? So this is all the LTIs that they have listed. And then they've linked out to all of those various places with um, information on those privacy policies. So if I click on the Canvas badges, for instance, it's going to take me here and give me the privacy policy for that particular LTI. And all of these will be links that you guys will have access to. I, I just thought that some of these sites were really helpful. Um, again, you know, it's just really informational more than anything. Uh, the institutional policies are great to know where they are so that, again, when questions come up from students, you can direct them or you can implement them in your course. So we kind of talked about third party apps and LTIs, but I'm not sure that everyone is really super clear about how LTIs and applications work. Um, there's two categories, really. Um, the LTIs, they're the fancy things to uh, you know, integrate into Canvas. They can be free or they can be paid. Uh, something that is usually institutionalized is something that the, the college or the, or the uh, district has paid for. They are usually, if it's an installed by a Canvas administrator, um, again, some institutions allow for facilitators or instructors to implement LTIs in their courses. And, you know, some examples, of course, publishers, you know, McGraw-Hill, uh, Lynda.com, um, all of those types of things are, are third-party tools. And it, that was a good list. Um, they are vetted by the institution. So they are usually go through the online education committee and in some cases uh, with a rubric and they're vetted for, you know, accessibility and all of the things that I will show you in the rubric later on, including the data policies. So it's, it's something that you can also use um, for your, for your vetting. Embedded applications are usually, usually, but not always free. Um, and these are usually the things that you are implementing in your own classes. Uh, you're either, you know, Padlet, Flip, OpenStax, um, other course publishers that might not be on the uh, institutional list. Um, those are all things that usually, you know, you all are finding and using and uh, you want to implement them in your own courses, right? So, um, you know, there's, there's literally hundreds of different things. Um, Christina, my textbook, it, Course LMS, is not supported by Canvas at my college. It would be free. What's the procedure to get that in your Canvas LTIs list? You would want to talk to your, uh, your either your um, DE coordinator or the Canvas LT or the Canvas administrator for the co college, I'd start with your DE coordinator first because usually when LTIs uh, are implemented, they're college wide or district wide. So there's there's a vetting process that they would have to go through, um, and usually that starts with your DE coordinator. Um, it's different at different colleges, but that's probably the best place to start. Did that help? Great. Anybody else have any questions about how that works? Okay. All right. So now, now on to the courses that you all are using in your course, in your courses, right? Um, so when you are looking at an application, now that you know about creepy cookies and you know about zombies, you know, and you don't want the zombie apocalypse to happen, you're trying to take an inventory of those third party apps that you might be using in your course that you've chosen to use, not the ones that are implemented necessarily by the college, because those are things that are already there and hopefully already vetted by your institution. You're looking at your third party applications, the Padlets, the Quizlet, the, you know, all of those types of things. Um, have you looked for those privacy policies? 
uh, where would you look for those privacy policies? The best way to find a privacy policy for any one of those things is type it into Google. Go to Google and type in, uh, for instance, you know, um, privacy policy for Flip or um, Padlet privacy policy. Those are the two things that come to my mind um, quickest, right? And and those, or if you already have the site posted up on your computer, you could just do a search on their site for privacy policies. In some cases, they have those little pop-ups like Canvas did that says, you know, are you going to opt in or out to those? And in which case the student would have those choices while they're actually at the location. But they still should know um, in your syllabus or uh, orientation that you are using those third-party tools and, and where to find that privacy information. So if you're using those, you know, take that inventory, take a look at those privacy policies, decide if you want to continue using it based on those policies, right? Because you might go to that site and get a privacy policy and go, holy smokes, I had no idea that they were using student information for this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, awareness is one of the best things, uh, tools in your toolbox. Um, and then you use rubrics to evaluate those. Um, I have a rubric, I, again, I'll show you at the end of this, it's a Creative Commons rubric that you can use that will help you in evaluating tools, not just for privacy, but also in evaluating other third-party apps. Um, and so in best practices, you know, if it's a baked in, I like to call it a baked in app, in Canvas, which means your institution has implemented it into Canvas, um, then, you know, they have an institutional policy. They have the Canvas links to the privacy policies and so forth. So, you know, you could implement that and put it into your syllabus or orientation. Um, you, you may want to look for those policies so you're aware when a student comes comes to you. Ask around if you don't see it on the website, if you don't know where to look, if you're not really sure, ask your department, you know, chair or your DE chair or your dean or somebody at the institution for guidance on that. Now, once you've determined that you're going to use your own application or external website, uh, create a checklist for yourself so that you uh, have a privacy policy statement in your orientation. You have a privacy policy statement in maybe in the first uh, assignment that you have a link to those um, privacy policies. And then the students can, um, can decide for themselves. You may want to add that personalized revocable consent uh, to your syllabus, create a survey in Canvas, and then uh, put it in your syllabus or orientation. I, I, you know, this one, I think if you're using websites, uh, if you're, you, if you're teaching an AI course, or you're using a lot of websites, this might be a really good best practice to give you one place. It's like a one stop shop for everything and giving the students all the information that they need um, that they can um, consent to. And the biggest thing, the most important thing is to allow for flexibility. Um, you know, plan for an alternative assignment, um, make, you know, make the time to allow, you know, maybe, maybe make it an option. How many of you are using uh, Padlet? Let's just throw that one out there right now. How many of you are using that? Anybody? Nobody's using Padlet? Come on. All right, Michael, you're using Padlet. Anybody else? All right. Fabulous. We do have some Padlet users. Yeah. So, you know, when you're using that in your course, are you giving students an, an option? Like, you know, uh, you can use this, you can join this group and do a Padlet, or you can join this group and use the internal discussion board. Have you had students that have asked you, um, you know, what the privacy policy was? How many of you have had that happen? where somebody's actually said to you, I, you know, what, what is this website doing with my data? We had any, has anybody had any of that? Nobody, really? 
Are you all just in a food coma because you finished eating an hour ago? <laughs> Nobody, nobody's, yeah. Nobody's had anybody ask. All right. Well, that's good because now you know what to say or where to find information when they do, right? Or come up with an alternative so you're not thrown for a loop when they decide that they don't want to do the assignment because they're concerned about the privacy situation. So having said that, does anybody have any questions? Looks like we have two in the chat. The first one from Christina and then the second one from Isabel. Christina, how do I get a comprehensive disclaimer for privacy to copy and paste in my syllabus? I currently have one just for FERPA. Well, that depends on um, what the comprehensive disclaimer. There are some sites out there you can search for, for, you know, privacy templates and all of those kinds of things. But are you talking about, you know, um, what your privacy policy is with regard specifically to uh, discussion boards and maybe sharing personal information about that. Um, because in that case, you would want, you would definitely want to uh, create, you know, some sort of a, this is how we are going to communicate. Everybody has netiquette policies usually and their discussion boards. Um, you would probably do it there. Um, you can search Google and do a, a privacy template. There's a whole bunch of them out there um, that you can utilize um, that, you know, sometimes they're free. Sometimes they're trying to get money out of you. So be careful with that one. But there are there are templates out there that you can get. Um, I don't have any of those particular links, but I do have privacy policies for some of the sites that are the most popular that are at the end of this session. Uh, my students are not at all worried about their privacy, which is why I need to worry for them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's so true. And, you know, I, it's like the uh, opt in and opt out. I mean, most people are just click, clicking accept all and moving forward. So it's good that, you know, you're one step ahead trying to give them a good, um, a good idea of what they should be concerned about. So what if faculty say students don't want to do an assignment uh, because of privacy concerns? Well, Lisa, that was actually my next slide. Thank you for segueing me into the what if scenario. So a student signs up for your class. Three weeks into the class, students realize the, that student realizes that there's a Padlet associated with an important assignment. The student emails you with concerns about third party privacy. Nope. You put all the standard best practices and included links to privacy policies for those apps in your online course. How would you respond to the student's concerns? So what do y'all think? I mean, what if, what, what would happen? What do you think you should do? What would you do? Come on, don't be shy. Alternative assignment, is it a group assignment? It could be, sure. Find an equivalent, suggests they use on-campus computers. Yeah, you know, it could be that um, they could go to a different location. That's a really uh, imaginative, that's a great idea. I mean, then they're not using their own personal computers. Sometimes their usernames or uh, identification or email addresses could still be tracked, but it's a good, it's a good idea. Individual assignment results can't be shared. Um, Correct. Yeah, absolutely. They can't be shared if they're, it depends on kind of what their security concern is, right? And this is related to that third party application that you're using. So, um, you know, the, the short answer to that, I mean, there's so many different scenarios that could be out there, but the short answer to that is, of course, to be flexible and to work with the student to try to find a way to help them feel comfortable, give them uh, more links or information if you have it um, to, you know, to those third party privacy policies, find out exactly what it is about that privacy uh, that is a concern for them. Is it their own personal safety? Is it just the policy of that particular website? 
Um, you know, I, I had a circumstance years ago with a student who didn't want to uh, participate in a discussion board in a class that someone was teaching. And um, it turns out that she had um, some issues with someone stalking her. And so she, you know, she was very concerned. That, that sort of thing comes up too. And that's more related to the communication student to student than it is uh, third party privacy. But those are the types of things that, you know, you, you try to work with the student and figure out uh, what it is that's bothering them about that. And then either put their mind to rest by finding the, um, the workaround for it, or you give them an alternative equivalent assignment. It's always good to have those um, equivalent assignments kind of in your tool belt um, before you finish doing the class. That way, you, you know. And uh, so is if there's no other questions, um, these are just some links uh, to some commonly used third party uh, privacy policies, the, the more um, the more popular ones. This one goes directly to Flip. It, again, most of the time you can just search uh, Google for these, but I thought maybe um, adding them in would be helpful. And uh, lastly, I have some other resources uh, that are helpful um, that you can utilize to uh, you know, explore a little bit more about privacy awareness and cybersecurity. Uh, some of these were really, really good uh, articles. Um, and the place that I found the rubric for evaluating e-learning tools was the Educause rubric. Um, and this one is a really, really helpful site. I'm going to click to it. And this was created by Lauren Ansley and uh, Gavin Watson uh, from the C Center for Teaching and Learning in Western University. And it was made available under the Creative Commons uh, attribution um, licensing. So you can use it uh, as a tool. And can you all see that okay? Um, I'm not sure that it's kind of small. And yes, absolutely, I will share with you the URL. All right. And um, so it is a little bit small. If you can't see it, you might want to click on the link and open it in one of your browsers. Um, you can see that it, it gives you, a, and this is good for online education committees that are trying to find an e-learning tool to evaluate their LTIs or for you personally as an instructor. So for those of you who might be doing that, um, it could work for either one of those. Uh, it's a little more comprehensive uh, than maybe you even need, but it gives you some good ideas of what to look for when you're evaluating these tools, not just the privacy. I thought maybe it would throw in a few other things like the accessibility and a lot of things that we forget about when we're looking at these third party tools, we just think they're cool and um, forget sometimes about some of these other things. So um, the reason I liked this one so much was because it does have a section specifically on privacy uh, data protection and rights. So hopefully that will be a helpful tool for you um, to use and implement in your course. Of course it is. So does anybody have any questions? We have time for questions. I don't know if I talked really fast or. <laughs> Go ahead and unmute yourself if you wanna just say hello and ask anything. Such a quiet group today. I have no question, but uh, thank you for sharing the information. I learned a lot more about cookies today than before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, creepy cookies, right? Yes. You'll never look at them the same. <laughs> yes, me too. And I'm just wondering, how do I get rid of them from my computer? Yeah, there um, you can, um, you know, it depends on your browser. 
uh, you can go to, um, again, Google is your friend. You can go to Google and search for clearing cookies on your specific browser and it will go through all of those. If you're using Chrome, there's uh, some advanced options that you can use in the settings when you go in there. And, um, and you know, you may, as far as, you know, how to avoid having those, again, those opt out things are good to know. So you're, you're not just clicking okay and getting them to start with. But if you already have them, it might be a good idea to uh, go with, you know, an antivirus software, do a search. Um, the, the VPN thing is also a really good idea. Mm -hmm. um, there's the zombie cookies sometimes can be problematic. So I would say if you can't get them off with your usual advanced settings on a browser to remove, if you could even find them, um, then your antivirus software would probably be able to find them. Yes, I, I use a vast, but um, the browser that I usually use is uh, Firefox. Is that not recommended? Um, or... No, there's there's no, you know, recommendation or non-recommendation, really. Um, it's it's one of those things that, um, you know, it's a personal preference. I like Safari, but a lot of the things that I do on a daily basis work better in Chrome. <laughs> so go figure, you know, I use all mm -hmm. of them. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, you just need to, uh, what I would do is search uh, the web, um, search Google for Firefox, uh advanced cookie clearing or okay. zombie cookie clearing. Mm -hmm. Valor, I was wondering if you could, speaking of browsers, would you be willing to speak to any of the plugins for various browsers that might help manage some of that or caution people to stay away from certain plugins? I mean, that's a yeah. rabbit hole you can go way down. <laughs> yeah, you can go so far. Um, yeah, you know, logins, um, one of those things, the 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 hard part about it is the balance right between being convenient and being annoying and being safe and um so and that's a really personal thing uh generally speaking i recommend if you really want to be diligent about your you know privacy is to you know not save your logins um you know, always log out of any app or any uh, course or anything that you're in um, that you have to log into. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people that log into, uh, you know, a, a website and then never log out. Well, if you close that browser, it may still keep the session active. And, and so those are things that, you know, every time you leave, um, you can clear out your cookies and and log out of whatever it is that you're in instead of staying logged in. But again, you know, those are things that are also extremely convenient for some of those people who, um, <laughs> you know, who don't want to spend time every day logging in to a website or a, an email address and remembering their passwords every five minutes, you know, so it's it's one extreme to the other. It, it just depends on your own personal preferences. Um, logins to, Brandon, when you asked that, did you mean to third party like applications in, in a, in a um, yeah. like in Flip? Uh, more like the plugins or extensions that you could use in say Chrome or Firefox or I don't know. So oh, as far as yeah. Much. Yeah, those. Um, yeah, you know, the interesting thing about those is I never use them. I, I um, and I mean, I would like to say, you know, they're harmless, but they're not in, in all cases. Um, again, you know, look for those privacy policies when you're doing a, a plug in in Chrome, you may want to look and see how they're using that data. I know that a lot of times they will say, you know, that you have to give permission to them for, you know, this login or that thing, or, you know, it sees this or that. Um, pay attention to those things because they're actually telling you what they're doing with that data. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, Vivian, being a techie, it's, it's funny. I, 
it's just convenient to, you know, to pass over those little things that say accept or don't accept. It's just, it's just, it's amazing to me how, how easy it is and how many people do it. Sometimes you can use control shift delete to get rid of cookies. Yeah. Um, it just depends on the browser, you know, uh, browsers are all very different and have different ways of doing things. So you share all the URLs for other resources as a list, sharing your PowerPoint with links. Um, yes, these are all going to be part of the presentation. Um, so you'll have access to all of those, all the stuff that I've mentioned in here today. Okay, I guess. All right, Anybody? shall we close this out then? If, if nobody has any other questions, sure. All right. Well, everybody, thank you for attending the webinar, giving Valerie your attention. I did post the link to the survey in the chat, if you scroll up a little bit, as well as a link to our webinar series. We have one more webinar, which is a repeat of this one this Thursday, but you can find all of our past webinar recordings on that site, which I will paste again in the chat right here. Now, we are really hoping that we get some feedback from you all on this webinar because while our spring series is closing, we will be looking at the survey data to inform how we offer our fall suite of webinars. And once again, this webinar and the associated slides will be posted on those website that I just posted. Again, just give us about seven days for us to be able to post an appropriately captioned webinar. And Christina, you asked that, will you email us the link to the recording? It'll actually be available on that site that I just posted in chat if you scroll up like two things. All right, folks, that concludes this webinar. And I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. I'll go on and stop the recording.